Good morning, everyone, from Emmanuel Baptist Church. I can't believe it. We are one week away from reopening our services. I can't wait. If you have been following along these sermons with us together, you live in the Columbus area, I want to encourage you to join us next week. Uh, come yourself, bring a friend. Just, just all of us having a chance to come back together, to meet new friends, new guests, I want to encourage you to come. I want to invite you to come. You'll be welcome here. There's been a lot of changes. We're following CDC guidelines. Uh, we are established laying out the seating so it's going to work just perfectly. We're going to have masks. We're going to have sanitizer. We're not going to have uh, the nursery and toddler ministry initially. We're just going to set things out and lay things out so that we're uh, loving one another from uh, six feet apart. That's what we want to do. We want to, we want to love one another from six feet apart. And so we're going to try to do that. We're going to worship together. We're going to open God's word together. We're going to encourage one another. If you're a guest and you've never been here before, we're going to welcome you. We're going to be a friend to you. We're going to, we're going to just, uh, we're just going to uh, extend a hand of uh, just encouragement and friendship to you. I want to, I want to invite you to come next week. We're going to continue an online presence. We're not sure when that's going to happen yet on Sundays. We're still working that through. It's going to happen on Sunday. As we have our service, we'll also have that online presence. We'll be communicating that to you. We are going to send out a letter this week. Had intended on doing that earlier, but a lot of things have come up. That's going to come out this week. We'll do another video, and we'll just give uh, information to you. So Sunday, wow, it's going to be here. I can't wait to see you, to meet new friends, and uh, continue ministry together. We are in the Gospel of John. I'm looking forward to that. Gospel of John chapter 16, we're in the Lord's final discourse. He's with the disciples one last evening before he goes to the cross. As he's emphasizing and speaking to them and reaching into their heart, he's emphasizing here really the reality of hardship, but he's going to bring the, the, the certainty of joy into the equation. We're going to see that. What a, what a beautiful truth that comes from the heart from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples and to us. You know, we go through hardship. We face such great difficulties following Jesus Christ at times and believers around the world. And yet he also tells us that joy is very much a part of that. He's going to teach us and show us how that's true. So I want us to begin by just looking at the reality of hardship here in John chapter 16. Let's begin by reading these initial verses. Chapter 16, verse 16, John says this. He says, In a little while... You will see me no longer, and again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you'll not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? And because I'm going to the Father? And so they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. And so he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me? As hardship is uh, being experienced and will be experienced by the disciples, this isn't new to them. They've already experienced hardship, but the Lord has protected them in many ways in, in the three years he has been with them. Now it's all gonna change. As they're stepping into the unknown, remember Jesus going to the cross. Everything is about to pivot in just a few hours. It's all going to change. It's going to fast forward in just a few hours. Their reality, their life, their experience, it's all going to change in just a few hours. And so Jesus is talking to them and he says, he says, in a little while, you're not going to see me any longer, but again, in a little while, you're going to see me. And if he's already told them in chapter 14, verse 1, I'm going to the Father and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And so they're confused about what's going on. He's going to the Father, and in a little while, we're not going to be able to see him. Well, of course, he's going to the Father, but in a little while, you're going to be able to see me. And, they, and, and, so, and so they're confused. You know, one of, the, one of the difficulties that we have when we face um, challenges, adversity, hardship in our life as we follow Jesus Christ, uh, there are many moments in our life when we just don't have all the answers. We don't know what's happening next. We can't figure out what's happened to us. We're trying to understand what's going on around us, what God is doing, what he's trying to communicate to our heart. Remember, God in the flesh 
through Jesus Christ, is talking to them face to face, and they are struggling to understand. God speaks into our life from his word and the Holy Spirit and, and people in our life, and, and we struggle with the same struggles. There are times when we're just confused, and we're facing, we're facing hardship, and we're facing challenges and obstacles and hurdles and the unknown, and we just don't know what's going on, and we don't have all the answers. In our nature, we just want to know. I mean, we just want to know what's going on. If we could just figure things out. And God often leaves us in a place where we don't have all the answers. And we have to trust Him. We have to place our faith in Him. And that's what's going on right here. Verse 18, is, you know, He says here that... Um, so they were saying, what does He mean by a little while? They were saying, it's, it's in the Greek, it's in the imperfect tense. It, it was kind of an ongoing conversation. Uh, this isn't like just a smooth uh, discussion here. There's there's talking and conversation going on, and they're and they're discussing among themselves what Jesus is talking about. What's he talking about? And they can't figure it out because they know it has implications on them. You know, you've many of you have been to a, maybe a camp ministry or Boy Scouts or something like that, and and you'll go to that place, and there's often a, uh, an opportunity to do initiatives, do a high ropes course or low ropes course or something like that. And so you'll be asked to, as an individual or as, as a, a group of people to, uh, to accomplish a goal, to, a, to accomplish a task. And yet the one who's facilitating that doesn't give you all the answers, doesn't give you the solution. You and I, we have to work that out on our own. We have to figure out the, the different pieces and parts. And if the facilitator has all that information and has the answers but chooses not to give it to us because, because there's a moment in, that, in going through that that it's productive in our life teaches us and we learn and as we go to a go to a camp and we learn through that initiative often in those environments we're learning about ourselves and we're learning about what Christ wants to accomplish in our life and and we're learning the the art of of being a team and working together and Jesus is giving them information but not all the information there are things that he wants to accomplish in their heart which necessitates they have to walk through an experience he does that in our life too and so they're facing confusion here He's gone, but, he, but they're going to see him again. What does that mean? Well, a couple things here probably it's referring to. Of course it means he's going to die. He's going to go to the cross, into the grave, and for a few days Jesus is going to be gone. As far as they're concerned, it's over. And then the resurrection is going to happen, and he's going to rise from the dead, and they're going to see him again. But then he's going to ascend to heaven again. But yet he's going to come again in the person of the Holy Spirit. He's going to live in our lives through the Spirit of God. And the character of Christ is going to indwell within us. But yet he's going to go to heaven. He's going to be gone. He's going to prepare a place for us, John 14, 1. But he's coming back again someday. And the rapture is going to occur, and he's going to bring the church home to be with him, every believer. In the second coming, he's going to gather his, his family together. And so there's a, there, he's, he's a little vague on what, what this specifically means. That's because there's, because there's ultimate fulfillments in them. There's, there's, a, there's different fulfillments in the way this is going to ultimately be carried out. Jesus is going to be gone, but he's going to return to them, the disciples, and then one day to us, the church. And so we see this as we walk through hardship. Sometimes we just don't have the answers, and that's hard. Right now, you might be facing just some things in your life, and you don't have all the answers. That's when we just turn to Christ and say, Lord, I know that you have the answers. And I know that maybe you're withholding answers from me because you're growing my faith. You're increasing my faith. You're calling me to draw near to you. That's what he's doing here. Hardship. It can be confusing. It can be agonizing in our life as well. Look at verse 20. So Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. And later in that verse, and you will be sorrowful. He says we will weep. Lament, be sorrowful. The disciples are going to be at the, at the, at the very bottom of the pit emotionally. Uh, they're, they're going to cry with grief. They're going to be in despair with grief. They're going to be distressed beyond hope. The sorrow is going to be such, so strong, so intense. How can you put it into words? Jesus Christ is no longer with them. He will die on the cross. They will see his death. What sorrow. They will see the crowds and the religious leaders humiliate Jesus Christ. He will be naked on the cross. They will beat him. 
spit on him, mock him, he will be utterly humiliated. What sorrow to their hearts. The victories will, the, the enemy will seemingly just win the victory. Jesus is going to die. He's going to be crucified. They're going to watch all that. These three years are going to seemingly just kind of go up in smoke. And Jesus is going to die. And they're going to be left behind. And, and there's going to be just this tangible loss of hope. What do, we, what do we do now? Where do we go? And they're going to huddle in fear. And so there's going to be just, just the agonizing elements. You know, it's amazing. Jesus is with them and all that, but they don't know it. Not here, not now. Jesus has a purpose to accomplish beautiful things in their life through, through this hardship. Jesus allows us to go through hardship. And he orchestrates hardship in our life for Christ. He orchestrates response back against us because of our walk in Jesus Christ. And all of that is, is in the beautiful, loving hands of, of Jesus Christ. But it can be agonizing. I have agonized in my walk with Jesus Christ. There have been times when I have been at the, the bottom of the pit. There have been times when you just have been at, been at a dead end and just have, have felt like there is nowhere to turn and nowhere to go. And I don't have any answers. And I'm confused. And God, what, God, what are you doing? You might be there right now. Well, you know what? These men here could identify with you. I can identify with you. Others in Christ, we can identify together because we've been there. Our experiences are all very different, but we can identify with that. And, and the setbacks in our life are very real. Also, we see here in verse 20, Jesus continues and he says this, And but the world will rejoice. The world will rejoice. You know, that's what makes it hard. You ever been kicked while you're down? You know, we hate to lose. Do you hate to lose? Do you hate to lose? Are you competitive? Do you always have to be right? Do you always have to be right? It's hard to lose. It's hard to be perceived as being on the losing end. It's hard to see the world take advantage of you. It's hard to see the world rebuke you. It's hard to see the world and other people in your life get the upper hand because of what Jesus Christ is doing in your life. Because, you know, often as we walk with Jesus, he takes us through those moments where, where it just may seem in the moment that we've lost. It may just seem in the moment that we don't have the answers to move us forward. The wall, the hurdle, is, it seems insurmountable. The defeat seems certain. The setback seems uh, insurmountable. I'll never overcome. The wound seems too great. The scabs too much. The emotional pain too hard to get over. <clears throat> You might be there. You've been there. I've been there. This is where their, the disciples are at. They've watched, they've watched the crowds now respond to Jesus Christ dying, and they have just rejoiced that Jesus is finally off of the scene. And they have, and they have mocked these believers, and, and, and you, could just feel, you could just feel the eyes of the crowd and the response of the crowd to the disciples and, and the followers of Jesus Christ. We won. We won. And let them have it. And the disciples run for their lives and they hide. It's, it's a terrible thing to be on the bottom. It's a terrible thing to feel like there's just no hope. It's a terrible thing for others to take advantage of you because you're lost. To laugh at your loss. To kick you while you're down. To, 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 to put a knife in and twist it even more. To rub salt in the wound. And if my greatest passion is, is to live for myself, if my greatest passion is to be loved by everyone else, if my greatest passion is to be exalted when I'm down and when I'm kicked, I tell you what, if Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God is not leading my response, if by faith I am not keeping my eyes on Jesus Christ, I will react against that hatred, against that joy against me. I will push back against it and it's going to get ugly. It's going to go bad in my life. And there are times we have reacted against people who have pushed against us in victory, it seems, or have, have felt like they had the upper, upper hand against us and rubbed it in our face. When we're walking with the Lord and trusting the Lord and striving to do what is an honor and, and pleases Him, then we can have the peace to respond by faith and with grace. The setbacks are very real. I don't want to talk about transformation. 
The disciples are going to face this. They're going to face these moments. They're just about to step into these moments. They're just about to, to experience all of these emotions and all of these things at the very fullest. It's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. It's going to almost destroy them. And yet, that's not the end of the story. And it's not the end of the story for you and for me as well. Verse 20 and 21, Jesus continues. He says, you will be sorrowful, but, 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 I love that. But your sorrow will turn into joy. Did you catch that? Your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. Boy, he, he talks about his hour, my hour has come. Ties in here to the hour has come. A, a lady is about to give birth. It's time but when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish, the suffering, the hurt, the pain, for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Boy, the sanctity of life here. The value of a life before the Father. But Jesus uses this beautiful illustration. He just reminds us. Moms, most of you, childbirth was exceedingly painful, difficult, and hard. For some of you, I have, I've heard of those women who give birth, and it's not really that terrible, but I've got to be careful what I say. It's a different experience from woman to woman. But it's painful nonetheless. And he uses this illustration, and he reminds the believers, giving birth is, is, is painful and it hurts. It can be excruciating. It can be hours upon hours of labor. When the time comes... The mother knows it. And it's work. It takes work to deliver a baby. Kids, me, I was a pain when I was born. And mom says, you were a pain. Yeah, we were a pain. But you know what? When the baby is delivered, that pain just goes away. And there is, there is the joy of that newborn baby. That's what the Lord is talking about. And he's reminding them here, that he will turn he will turn their sorrow into joy that's what he's, he's going to do he's going to take he's going to take their sorrow and he's not going to replace it with joy he's going to transform it see what he's done is he's he's allowing the disciples to go through this excruciating pain because the hour has come his hour has come but it's their hour as well it's their hour of experiencing what it means to follow Jesus Christ we don't have the answers, and the enemy seems to gain the upper hand, and it, and it, and it cuts like a knife into every area of our life, and the pain is excruciating, and yet it's producing something in the life of these disciples they will never forget. It will transform and change their lives. They will be, they will be powerfully different by the divine grace of God in their life from this moment forward than they ever would have been otherwise. Jesus is reminding of that. He says, I'm going to transform your pain into joy. The child who was delivered was pain. The child who is delivered is now joy. He transforms that pain into joy. He produces a result that is far beyond the pain that was experienced when we were going through the agony of the hardship. The result, the transformation is worth it. It changes everything in our life. We no longer quite remember the pain and the anxiety like it was because we experienced the joy, the blessing of a relationship with Christ. You know, you know the reality of, of diamonds. There's a great debate, actually, as I was reading about this. There's great debate as to whether diamonds actually come from coal or not. That's been, that's been what I've believed my whole life. But there's, there's a lot of discussion in the scientific field now as to whether that really is the case. Coal and diamonds are both have carbon in them, but the carbon in coal is, is much is not near as pure as the carbon that's in diamonds. There's processes that seem to be different in what produces a diamond than the coal. Similar but different. Um, it's amazing. For a diamond to become a diamond, it has to go through, I'm just reading here, stuff I don't know. Temperatures have to reach 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. For a, um, 
a mineral to become a diamond, for this carbon to become a diamond. The pressure is 725,000 pounds per square inch. I can't even, I can't even imagine, I can't even put that in my mind. What's that mean? That kind of pressure. And then so it goes through that heat and it goes through that pressure and then it, it goes through this cooling period. It's, it's, it's exhaled from the earth through the lava flows and whatnot and it's all lifted up and you know there's a whole process here I, I don't fully am aware of but but there is there is the there is the clear process of heat and pressure coming together and then cooling and it produces this beautiful diamond it produces this we spent thousands of dollars on diamonds Jesus is producing something in our life through the hardships we face in the lives of the disciples here something that will be eternally lasting you know, Joseph in the Old Testament, he was a slave. He was a criminal for a time. He was in jail. He was found himself in a hopeless situation. And yet God turned it into victory. God transformed his pain, his terrible experiences into victory. He became second in Egypt and, and he delivered his people to Egypt for a time. Israel was enslaved by Egypt. And they just, and they just persecuted Egypt more and more and more and more. And yet all that happened is that God just multiplied the people even more. And, and they prospered even more. And they became so big that the Egyptians were terrified of them because they outnumbered the Egyptians. David was relentlessly pursued by Paul over and over and over and over again. What it produced in his life was just this. God made him a man after his own heart. David had his failures, and we know about those failures. But it produced character, the character of Christ in David's life. The hardship produced the character of Christ character of God in his life and he became a king and then he became and then he wrote the word of God and the Psalms which are so poignant and so authentic and so genuine and so real and touch our hearts he wrote the word of God and and then Jesus takes the cross just the, the symbol of shame the symbol of defeat and he just then he transforms that pain he transforms that symbol into a symbol of victory and that's what he does in your life you know you we have symbols of pain in our life, and we have remembrances of pain in our life. We have sins that we'll never forget, and we have, we have things that we've done that we've never forgotten. And yet Jesus, when he, when he saves us in Christ, he forgives us, and he washes us from those things, and he transforms us. And even in Christ, when we, when we confess our sins, he washes us, and he forgives us, and he, and he transforms us, and he uses hardship to, to, to uh, purge things out of our life, and we become... Uh, with clarity, more beautiful in the hands of Jesus Christ and are able to be used for him. Joy, where does it come from? It comes from Christ. Look at verse 22. So in verse 22, we read these words, And so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. It is all about the presence of Christ. And they don't understand it. They can't wrap their heads around it yet, but they will. And this is going to be precious to them when they look back and say, oh, 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 now I see what he was saying. Jesus says, I'm going to see you again. What changes their joy is the resurrection, but what changes their joy is his presence in their life. And the presence of the Spirit of God. It is the very presence of Christ. When we hang to and grab a hold of the presence of Jesus Christ, we have the very resource we need to walk us through and to hold us steady in times of hardship. He secures joy in our life. That's what he does. Look at verse 22. And your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. No one. No one will take your joy from you. The joy of the resurrection, no one can take that from them. And our joy is from Christ. Christ rose from the dead. He will never die. We can never die. We have that hope. We're going to be with him someday. He has given us life eternal. You know, our joy is from, a, a, because he rose from the dead, he gives us a future. You know what? We have a future in Christ. When we're going through hardship and adversity, challenges, the fiery trials of a believer, we can keep our eyes focused on Christ. We can look ahead to what he's promised, what he's laid out for us, the hope we have in Christ, and it sustains us. It keeps us true. You know, that relationship that we have in Jesus Christ, he is our ultimate satisfaction. I trust he just satisfies you more than anything else. I can't lose my joy. He says, no one can take your joy from you. And here's a question. Why, why are so many Christians at times joyless? Is it because this is not true? It's the opposite. That joy is always there. The fruit of the Spirit is, is joy. 
The reason we lose joy in our life is not because it fails. It's not because it's insufficient. It's because we give that joy away. We allow, we allow the thief to take it. We take our eyes off of Christ, and the minute we do that, the joy of the Lord, which is available to us right there, for that moment, it eludes us because now we are looking over here. Now we are looking at bitterness or anger or coping mechanisms, and we take our eyes off of Christ and we, and we strive to fix our own life. And the minute we take our eyes off of Christ, the minute I take my eyes off of Christ, joy eludes me. Is it gone? Is this promise now ruled null and void? Of course not. It is powerfully true in that moment. All we must do is return our eyes of faith to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't understand. And Lord, I don't know what comes next, but I will trust you. And in that trust and through that faith, I will experience the joy of your loving arms wrapped around me, walking with me, caring for me. You can do that. You can yield to the Lord. You can keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. He is the author. He is the finisher of your faith. You can do that. Your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Isaiah reminds us, God is my salvation. I will trust, and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength, and he's my song. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Joy flows. It comes from a genuine relationship with God. He is my God, my strength. He is my song. To the, to the child of God who continues to walk with the Lord by faith. Through the hardships of life, we never lose that right there, ever. The song, the strength, the faith, the ability to move forward. Through the Spirit, through the Word, through the presence of Christ, He infuses us with a power to experience these very realities in our life. That's joy producing. Acts 5, 41. Disciples, they left the presence of the council. They were persecuted there, beaten there, and they were, yet they were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name, the name of Christ. Joy embraces hardship. The disciples would learn that hardship is joy. They would learn that it is, it is, it is a privilege and it is an honor to go through hardship, to have the world hate you, to have your life called into question because of your adherence your allegiance to Jesus Christ, to be hated for that, to have the opportunity to give testimony to Jesus Christ, to speak of the truth of his grace, of his mercy, of his forgiveness, of the changing power of the word of God, to be, to be persecuted for that, what a privilege. It is joy. And you know what? It's true. To take a stand for Jesus Christ and to be hated for it, but to know that you're representing the Savior, the Creator of this world, the one who gave His life for you, what a privilege. 1 Peter 4.13, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may rejoice and be glad when His glory was revealed. Joy brings perspective into hardship. One day God's going to honor every, every child of God who has walked faithfully. Every child of His, He's going to honor. He's going to reward. He's, he's going to, with His presence, with eternal blessing, with the rewards of given because of faithfulness to Christ, the joy will be so great in that moment. And that joy begins here as we trust the Lord. First Peter 1 Peter 1.8 Though you, we haven't seen Christ, you love Him. Though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him, and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. And joy just comes out of my life when it's least expected because I just I love Christ. I love what he's accomplishing in my life. I don't understand it, but I embrace it. And I say, Lord, you know what you're doing. So continue to give me eyes of faith and fill my heart and my life with joy in these difficult, hard moments. God, do that. Do the impossible. By your spirit, fill and indwell every corner of my life with the joy of the Lord. 
Help me to rest in your promises and your trust. And then verse 23 to 24, John says, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. In that day, after his after his resurrection, after his ascension, he goes up to be with the Father, John 14, 1, to prepare a place for us. He is, he is gone physically, and yet he now is going to send the Spirit of God. Up to that time, when they have prayed, they have prayed to the Father. They have prayed based upon the promises of the Old Testament. They come, they've come to, the, to, to the, the presence of the Father based upon, based upon his promises that he's laid before, and they've prayed on that basis. And they continue to do that, but now it changes drastically. Now when Jesus is gone, the prayer is going to change. The way they pray is going to change. They're going to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. They're going to, they're going to pray in a way that brings honor to the name of Jesus Christ. They're going to pray uh, with the authority of Jesus Christ. To use his name is to bring his authority to bear. When I use his name, I have access to every privilege and every blessing in the presence of God the Father. It is Jesus, his name on my life and on your life that gives us access. You know, we've sinned. We've done terrible things. We have failed. But when we are saved by grace and a child of God, we have the privilege of coming to the very presence of the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. And as we pray, we have an intimate, personal conversation with the Father through Jesus Christ. And on his basis, on his blood over our life, under, over his cleansing and washing and forgiveness into our life, on his authority, we can have a continued conversation with the Father. We can pray. And it is joy. Because we pray and talk to the Lord, it fills our life with relationship. It fills our life with answers to prayer. It fills our life with certainty. It grounds us. It transforms us. It conforms us. It changes us. Prayer changes us. He says, I'm giving you the joy. Of, I'm giving you the, the vehicle of prayer, personal prayer, and it's going to change your life. It's going to fill you with joy. If you're not a praying believer, you're missing out on what joy is all about. If you are faithfully praying to the Lord and talking to the Lord and in prayer letting Him change you, then you know the power of prayer because it brings joy into your life. And so he finishes here. and He, he says, you know what? Your intimacy with me is never going to change. You can still talk, and I will mediate in your life everything. I will mediate everything. I will bring your heartbeat, your requests, your hardships, your aches, your dreams, the mission of Christ in you. I'll bring it to the Father, and I will accomplish that. It is relational. Finally, John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. You know, joy flows from a relationship with Christ. You know what? If I don't enjoy God, if I don't enjoy Him, if you don't enjoy Him, you and I, we will never obey God. We will never pursue Him. We will never worship Him. We will never live for God. The reason so many believers don't do the right thing and don't live for Christ is because they don't enjoy God. Teens, all the way up to elderly people, people who love the Lord, young people, if you love Jesus Christ with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, you obey Him. You follow after Him and you'll know the joy of the Lord. It comes from a relationship with Christ. Remember, this is the final discourse. In chapter 15, Jesus talked about the vine and the branch. He talked about the essential, the essential need to have an organic relationship with Christ, to abide in Christ to organically be connected to Christ through salvation, through faith in Christ. He prunes in our life. He's always taking things out of our life so that we can grow more. He's allowing us to go through adversity, just as he did the disciples here. Great hardship, intense hardship, to accomplish his work in our life. Through that, he gives us the privilege of bearing fruit. Through that, he gives us the, the opportunity to obey His commands, to follow through on His Word, to be defined by the love of God. We might love one another and love Him with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. 
That's where joy flows from. Joy flows from that relationship with Christ. If you want to experience joy this morning, if it's missing in your life right now, if you're saying, God, I want that joy, then it starts with a relationship with Christ. Then it continues by organically being connected to Christ, walking in Christ, bearing fruit for Christ, obeying His commands, following through in obedience to His Word. All of this brings joy. And he says here, then our joy will be complete, it will be full. My joy may be in you, and your joy will be full, complete. I pray this morning, no matter what's going on in your life, God's made a promise to you. He's invited you not to pursue the other things in your life for joy, but to run to Him. And He will give you that joy. He will settle your heart. He will keep your eyes focused not only on Him, but on what He's promised for us in the future. We invite you to come next Sunday. We're looking forward to that. Join us together. We will be communicating with you. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the joy of the Lord in hardship. Lord, by the Spirit of God, by faith in the Word of God, which which takes us directly into that personal relationship with you, God, continue to produce the promise, fruit of the Spirit, that is the joy of the Lord in our life. No matter what we're going through, you have promised to give us that joy. A smile in our heart, a settledness in our heart, um, a faithful, continued walk in the Lord that's filled with joy. God, help us to that end, that our testimony would be strong and be clear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming.